obviously it's a pretty privileged view, but the pandemic was, you know, this opportunity to stop the touring cycle, which obviously we love touring, but um, it was really an opportunity to get a few things sorted. And I think including that was my health a little bit, being on the road so long, you know, touring for several months a year for about five years, I just kind of let things lapse a little bit. So when all the gyms shut down in March 2020, I've never really ran before, but because I was really into weightlifting and that sort of thing, I started running and then I kind of didn't stop running. And now I do, now I've sort of gotten into ultra marathons and that sort of thing. So I've become a really boring person. Um, everything that made up my personality has just kind of washed away and I've become this guy that runs now. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcasts, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to rate it and write a review. Now, why do I want you to do that? Well, you have to imagine that when someone is looking for a new podcast to listen to, what do they do they scroll down they look at those reviews if those reviews are favorable and they say that my podcast is amazing that i have the best guests that i'm a great insightful host that i ask great questions well they might just give that podcast a chance so by you rating the podcast or even better by writing a review you might actually be the person that helps sway someone's decision to become a brand new Vox and Hops head, and that would be something that I would truly appreciate. Now, today's episode was recorded at this month's Thirsty Thursday virtual hang. You should have been there. It was an absolute blast. Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops episode number 356 with Jordan James of Disentomb. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I am very stoked to be back with Jordan James of Disentomb. Jordan, it's been a hell of a long time. Uh, little did we know when we sat down together in the fall of 2019 that uh, a whole global pandemic would keep us apart for this long, that we wouldn't be able to hang out. We wouldn't be able to drink beer at St. Buck as we did when I recorded episode 88 with you. Uh, let's dance into a very simple question to start. Jordan, how are you doing? Aside from technical difficulties, uh, pretty good. Um, I'm on paternity leave at the moment, so my wife and I welcomed our uh, second child into the world two weeks ago. So I'm on holidays at the moment, which is, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like holidays because it's a lot of sleepless nights. But other than that, working on New Disentomb, we're getting ready to release that. So between fatherhood and brutal death, uh, you know, going pretty good. You're, you're living on fumes. I know what those those first weeks are like. It's so, so difficult to be a father. And here you are in Vox and Hops, and you're in Australia. Here I am in Montreal. Everyone else joining here right now that I can see right now are in uh, North America. So it's nighttime for us, so we're drinking beer. But you're being a trooper, and you're having a beer right now, which I love. Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends, talking about their lives, music and craft beer. What are you drinking right now? What are we sharing virtually today, Jordan? I'm drinking a Burley Twisted Palm by Burley Brewery. So it's a uh, brewery that's right near my drummer's place on the Gold Coast. So it's a tropical pale ale. Nice. Uh, so it's quite refreshing. So it's not too bad to have in the morning, actually. It's. I was just going to say, it's, it's basically like orange juice. I, I'm, I, I appreciate the sacrifice. Uh, the, the, from experience, it's best to stop after that one, if not... Uh, the day keeps going. Yeah, definitely. I think I'll switch back to tea after. <laughs> uh, this is a special brew from Ghost Town Brewing that I've been looking forward to drinking. It's called Zest for Death. It is um, from their special Barrel Age series. Um, it's super fucked up. I really, really am very excited for it. Uh, they got to California and kumquats, grapefruit skin. Um, it's it's just juices from the flesh of both it's it's gonna it's been got mixed fermentation oak cage uh very stoked to try this massive shout out to uh jameson kester for hooking me up with this one when he hooked me up with some of the devastation on the nation brews that he uh sent me it was awesome i'm very stoked i'm gonna crack this and uh i would love 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 to hear about the shittiest question that I'm going to ask you from here on out is going to get more fun, but it's the question that I have to ask everyone since it's been so long we haven't hung out. Uh, how the hell did you cope with the glorious years of 2020, 2021, and most certainly, hopefully not, the rest of 2022? How have you been coping during these wonderful, wonderful times? 
So I, I think um, for me anyways, it, it's a pretty privileged view, but the pandemic was, you know, this opportunity to stop the touring cycle, which obviously we love touring, but um, it was really an opportunity to get a few things sorted. Um, and I think including that was my health a little bit, um, being on the road so long, you know, touring for several months a year for about five years, I just kind of let things lapse a little bit. So when all the gyms shut down in March, 2020, I'd, I've never really ran before, but because I was really into weightlifting and that sort of thing, I started running and then I kind of didn't stop running. And now I do now I've sort of gotten into ultra marathons and that sort of thing. So I've become a really boring person. <laughs> um, everything that made up my personality has just kind of washed away and I've become this guy that runs now. So it's, um, other than that, I, I spent a lot of 2020, um, because my work didn't shut down. Um, I work in the media, so obviously it was quite busy for us. Um, but working from home, um, yeah. And j just really got into running, got into really focusing in on myself a little bit, you know, it, it sounds super cliche, but getting into yoga, getting into meditation and actually sort of, it, it was a really good opportunity for me to reset. And I think all the guys in this and Tomb found the same thing um, where we've sort of been able to refocus on ourselves. And now it's sort of going back in. Now everything's opened up again in Australia for the most part. Um, you know, we can tour internationally again um, and getting into the swing of the things yeah, it's just now juggling, you know, our new lives that we've had to build with, um, with you know, I guess, our old lives, which was, you know, touring and living sort of a pretty crazy lifestyle. It's a, it's a, it's a baffling thing to, to have one identity and then all of a sudden it's like it's taken away from us, it's gone. But good for you. You could have gone either way. I've spoken to people that have gone one way or the other way. You went towards the healthy route, uh, the getting your your angst out, uh, not on stage, but through running and health and uh, meditating and yoga, and that's commendable. It's uh, to find the balance between the two once you're out there. That's oh, I, I should I should say there was definitely a point where I think the first two weeks of lockdowns and everything, um, because the bottle shops never closed. Like you could buy alcohol still, and I, I don't know if that's just an Australian thing, but you know you could still buy alcohol at all hours but um yeah for the first two weeks my wife and I were getting a bottle of red wine every night and sort of just you know and then I was sort of noticing I was looking at my clock every day at about five being like oh you know it's wine time and then after about two weeks when I started getting sort of because I've never been a big drinker but when I um when I started noticing I was getting those sort of cravings a bit because I think I do have an addictive personality when I started getting those cravings, that's kind of when I'm like, oh, shit, I need to stop this. And that's when I sort of just started running instead and tried to get addicted to something that wasn't, you know, going to make me feel like shit in the morning. Absolutely. And it makes you feel amazing running. You you chase that runner's high, I've heard. You, you yeah, yeah it's definitely a real thing. Yep. And then you have to run farther and farther to keep getting that same level of exhilaration. It's a, it's an addictive personality thing for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because I, I started running, I, I could only run 200 meters um, when I first started. And I was, yeah, I, I really couldn't run. I've never ran in my entire life until like, just before I turned 30 could only run 200 meters. And then, um, that was in 2020. And then last year I ran my first hundred kilometer, which is 80 miles. And then Didn't you run something uh, like overnight in the night. Am I crazy? Yeah. yeah, so I, ran, yeah I ran for 15 hours, um, <laughs> 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. So, I mean, it's kind of like, I guess, you know, don't just get into metal, get into brutal death metal, you know, <laughs> don't get into running, get into ultra marathons. I guess, I know my wife, when I started running, she's like, oh, you're going to take this to some sort of <laughs> stupid level. And, you know, she was right. Well, cheers to that. Cheer, cheers to healthy decisions versus uh, unhealthy ones, uh, despite how yeah. much they hurt in the morning sometimes. Ooh, this smells amazing on the nose. The, the zesty, oaky, colors, gorgeous, light yellow, hay color, tart, tart as hell, woody. Very cool. Very cool. Zest for death. Love it. Love it. Ghost Town Brewing. You can get it, get it, people. 
Um, a question I didn't ask you last time, which I always end up asking, is uh, the soundtrack of your youth. Uh, when you're growing up in your parents' or guardian's house, what music was playing? When you were not in control of the radio, what music did your parents or guardians listen to? Honestly, honestly it was pretty um, stock standard in terms of, I'm not sure if anyone outside of Australia has heard of Jimmy Barnes. No, Jimmy Barnes is like a real Australian sort of, he's like mainstream ACDC. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was a lot of Jimmy Barnes. It was a lot of um, Dire Straits as well, you know, that sort of thing. And my dad was really into Pink Floyd. Um, so that was kind of what was my soundtrack growing up. Um, and I guess, you know, things like ACDC. And then I think it was when I was around eight or nine, because I had two older, I have two older brothers. Um, and that's when, you know, they were, they were around and, you know, they were sort of, 15, 16, around the year 2000, 2001, and then naturally System of a Down sort of started being played in my house and Corn and Marilyn Manson and that sort of thing, and that's naturally where I sort of gravitated to. Who got into the Matty Ways first? Because I know that he's your, your, your biggest inspiration influence. Did, did you get more brutal than your brothers, or did they go there and show it to you? No, they, they kind of stopped around uh, the System of a Down <laughs> phase, and then... Um, it was because Jake, Jake and I lived in a small town together. Jake, the guitarist of Disentum, we lived in a town of about four thousand people, um, and he had an older brother who was the same age as my middle brother, and we, we both were in a system of a down, like you know, around the ages of you know ten or eleven, and then we just started sort of getting into together. Um, this is back in the LimeWire days. We just started downloading like Cannibal Corpse, and I think we were thirteen when we first heard Brodequin and started downloading and just sort of, it became this sort of search for what's the most heaviest, disgusting, most disgusting thing in the world. And then I think it was Jake who discovered Disgorge mm. um, and then showed it to me. And then it was a really weird thing where we were in this mall when I was like 14 and we there was like a, a shop selling bootleg shirts and there was a Disgorge um, cranial empowerment shirt. This is like in this random mall. I don't even know how they would have had a Discord shirt. And we ended up buying it like together because and we, we couldn't even like as, as ridiculous as, as it sounds, we couldn't <laughs> even read the disgorge logo, mm. but it just, it was like a guy with a knife going through his head. So we're like, Oh, that is sick. And then it ended up being, you know, we we're wearing it around, not knowing what it is. We're like 14, 15. So it was ridiculous, but it ended up being, you know, one of our favorite bands and literally one of the most influential albums in the genre. Um, cranial empowerment so that's kind of the weird sort of way we got into disgorge and they're still my top tier favorite band yeah. i know i love it i love it did you, you bought it together did you each buy yes. one or did you share a shirt there was only one <laughs> <laughs> it's like sharing it together. We, we were in the city for the day and then we literally went back to our country town of four thousand people and yeah it was weird times it was the early 2000s what was was there a schedule how did you organize? <laughs> there, there wasn't a particular schedule. I think it was, uh, you know, I think it stayed at Jake's place. <laughs> uh, what was your family's reaction to you getting into much more extreme music? Uh, I think my, my parents were always very sort of supportive and open. So um, they, they didn't really care too much. I think I can remember one or two conversations being like, oh, you know, they, they were kind of weirded out by the music. And I think when I started trying to do vocals around the age of 15 in the shower, <laughs> they were sort of, you know, my, my vocals definitely got better when I moved out at 17 because, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't have my dad knocking on the door telling me to shut up. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, um, it's a really important thing for people learning vocals to, to you have to not be shy. And it's such a hard thing to do when you know people are listening and you're learning, right? Unless you just have that personality that can just pull it off. <laughs> Yeah, and if you have, like, you know, people telling you to not do it, <laughs> it's definitely, uh, it can be definitely a bit difficult. Or if you have neighbours that might call the cops on you or something. <laughs> so, so you go through all this, you, you end up, you know, this and tomb starts. Um, how you obviously finished your schooling because you work in the media. You, I know you're a journalist. So, so you you did the right thing. Uh, what do what do your parents think now? Now that you 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 obviously have succeeded, uh, toured the world for five years straight. Um, the father of two, an accomplished uh, journalist. So, so what what is their 
how do they feel about you as an extreme vocalist or how do they feel about extreme music now? I think it first dawned on like, my, I remember the conversation I had with my mum where, you know, she was aware we were playing shows in Brisbane and like we would like, which we all moved to to study at university. And then we eventually would play interstate shows when we were like 18 or 19. And then I think it first dawned on my mum that this is a real thing when we did our first European tour in 2011. Because I remember her being like, like, you know, asking, are you serious? Like, you know, are you actually doing, like, is it actually going ahead? And then once we actually went over there, I think it first dawned on my mum that, you know, there's a, that there's actually a, a crowd that listens to it, that it, there's actually a following to the genre. Um, and, you know, and then it eventually turned into like all mums, you know, mum doing those um, cringe sort of proud of my son posts, like <laughs> posting photos of me looking like an absolute, like, you know, pulling faces on stage and, you know, doing whatever I do on stage, posting those photos and saying, my son's going over to Europe today, you know, bragging to all of her friends. So, it, you know, she... Very supportive. It's important, and um, it's hard when you're young to to. I don't want to say do do the right thing, but to to do the backup plan thing, the safety net thing. That's the right thing. It's it's hard to do the safety net thing of getting a career and pursuing your art at the same time it's it's something that is as an artist is extremely difficult to swallow but if you can do it and if you have that mental capacity to juggle many things i encourage everyone to do it but it's not easy was there moments for you where it was like i just want to just i want to be an artist i just want to do i want to go tour and there was the obligations of finishing schooling. Was that difficult? I remember for myself, it was it was a it was a juggle. So we did our first European tour in 2011 after just after I finished university. So well, I finished university, and then I actually just sort of had a gap year working as a forklift driver in a factory, um, just sort of finding out what I wanted to do if I wanted to use my degree. And then we did our first European tour, and then we came back, and I started my career in um, the media. And then it was this, it was actually a really difficult juggling act for essentially the entire time we've been touring where uh, thankfully uh, my company and um, the people I report to have been very supportive over the years. And I would use all my leave, all my holidays to go tour. So it was, there there were times of extreme stress um, where I'd be trying to work really hard and I'd work extra hard when I'm back from tour. And then and then going away on tour using all my holidays, you know, it, it was, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it if you think you're cap- unless you think you're capable of it or, or if you want to do it. But um, it was extremely stressful and some of the times, you know, just, you know, being able to make both of those things work um, at the same time, especially if you have a partner as well, you know. So that's why you know it was much easier to get the start going in early 20s before everything kicked off um and now and and that's i think the the hardest thing that's going to be going back into it where we're in that next phase of our lives where you know we've got children and stuff now and you know that last tour i did in 2019 i didn't have a daughter i came back home and five days later my daughter was born that's true that i remember it's um you're gonna miss a lot of things and it's something that as an artist we have to accept <laughs> Which sucks. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So well, we actually have our first tour. Um, well, we, we've played a few festivals during the pandemic um, around Australia, but we um, but we have our first tour, an Australian tour with Defeated Sanity, and it's only one week, but that's that'll be good to ease us back into it while juggling everything else, you know. So. Absolutely. It's a monster of a tour. Defeated Sanity, Wraith, from July 7th to the 14th. A um, bunch of dates. Australia, rocking it. Uh, your first time away from your baby. Are, are, are you? Are your first time away from from the kids in general? Um, are you ready for that? I wanted to do a whole segment later on about being a metal dad and and the balancing act. Here, I guess this whole episode is basically going to be about balance. Here we go. I like. I'm liking this this thematic that's come up. The balance of, of being an extreme metal father. Uh, are you prepared for that? Uh, luckily, we have the the world of technology at our fingertips, where we can we can just FaceTime and be in the house for a second. Albeit, it's extremely difficult and completely not the same. But it is a special little way for us to connect with our family, even if we're away. Are, are you prepared for 
missing thing and and being away and finding that balance yeah although i'm i think i'm mentally prepared for it um but i think just leaving you know i think the biggest thing is probably dealing with the guilt of being away from you know the because when you leave you understand the load is going to be extra on your partner and you will miss things so i think naturally that's going to come with its fair share of guilt and you know and that sort of thing but um thankfully what will make it easier is all the guys in distant term are you know literally my best friends um you know and it's never a, a depressing time to say the least so you know oh, i think that will help definitely and and the guy actually the guys in the band are you know quite you know involved and try to be involved with my kids so it's um they'll be quite understandable as well. it's a whole family and i love it i love a, a family band situation that becomes a part of of the family it's it's a special thing to have so you guys should keep embracing that uh you guys have been busy uh the decaying light was a massive success uh people were freaking out it's so good you're writing a new ep uh what can you tell us about this uh i've seen nothing online so I feel like uh, we got some breaking stuff here. What's going on with this new EP for Distant 2? Yeah, look, it's only four tracks. Um, so it's a really short release. Um, but it's the first time the majority of the music has actually been written by our bassist, Adrian Capaletti. Um, and it's, I would say, it's some of our most accomplished work. It's definitely a step forward from The Decaying Light. Um, and Misery, it's just, it is a progression. Um I just finalised vocal patterns and lyrics just earlier this week, actually. Um, and it's going to be called Nothing Above. And, yeah, it, it's the artwork is going to be done by Nick Keller, who did The Decaying Light and Misery. Um, you know, he's a fantastic artist. And, you know, everyone says this is our most accomplished work, but I think anyone who listens to this will hear, you know, if, if you're a fan of Disentomb and you've listened to Disentomb previously, you will hear elements of Disentomb, but... You'll also, it, it's much more expansive um, and it's still got gutturals over it, so people will still be stoked. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it still sounds like I'm vomiting over some really technical music, so it's, um, I think I think people will like it. Well, to be honest, I don't give a fuck if people don't like it, but I'm kind of beyond that. But <laughs> It's yours. It's yours. Own it. Uh, I am in the process right now of writing vocal patterns and lyrics. How do you find writing vocal patterns? It's tedious, but I'm, I'm really, really lucky to have Christian Donaldson in the band, and he definitely works with people all the time, so he knows what is redundant and what is fresh, and he's extremely difficult on me. For myself, I, I need to really just comprehend the music first. It's, it's extremely difficult <laughs> honestly where is the one why is there only three and a half this time where is the rest of it it's it's extremely complex stuff the new cryptopsy that we're working on right now uh how do you basically go about structuring your songs and go about creating uh patterns for yourself the importance of lyrics we spoke about that last time about the importance of lyrics even though no one can understand what the hell we're saying sometimes <laughs> look at Admittedly, as a non-musical person, I'm I'm completely I'm the least talented person in the band by far. I, I can't play an instrument at all. Um, as you saw from the technical difficulties, I have some issues with uh, mastering a laptop sometimes. So, um, so understanding the technicality of our music is a real um, is a real challenge sometimes, and that's where I do need the help of Jake, a guitarist, or our bassist Adrian to sort of really sit down with me and and go through it with me, um, and then once I'm, once I'm really sit down and listen to it and get a feel for it, then I can kind of hear the phrasings and how it's going to go. And the way I write, it's vocal patterns first. You know, I go through how the syllables are going to be, and then I match, and then I write lyrics and match the lyrics over it. Now that's kind of what works best for me, to be honest, um, rather than trying to write lyrics and fit them into songs. It's so hard. I, I've tried both ways. And even with this one that I'm writing right now, which is a full length, um, I have done some where it's the lyrics and I go and attack it and it doesn't feel as natural. So I stopped doing that and I kept going forward with the let's dissect 
these patterns and see what fits but really just comprehending the basics of what's going on in the song is definitely step one and that just it's massive amounts of listening a, a trick that i've been doing and it's the first time i'm doing this because of the podcast is i use reaper to edit all my shit uh, so i've been dropping the file the song into reaper and then i've been just slowing it down so i can actually hear the riff at a at a slower tempo so i can actually understand what the hell they're playing <laughs> or count the amount of snare hits that flow's doing or stuff like that it's actually been really um helpful uh, it's something that I've, I've actually really enjoyed doing i've actually done the exact same thing where i've been using reaper for the first time and just cutting the riffs up and listening to the riffs over and over again and and just sort of having that on repeat that's been really helpful that's a good idea too that's a really good idea i'm gonna do that <laughs> i have i have three four more songs to do uh you mentioned adrian wrote most of these four tracks uh is that because of the situation of the pandemic for him he found himself in a, in, a, in a situation where he could write and record he was more had more time on his hands well what's the reason behind him writing more than previous releases i think it probably comes down to writing a little bit more because he has time on his hands um, Jake, our guitarist, has sort of started his own career um, due to the pandemic. You know, he's really doing well in his job. Um, since everything shut down, he's, you know, excelling in his job. So I think Adrian does have a little bit more time on his hands and it's just naturally came that way. Um, the, the crazy thing is Adrian is such a masterful musician and him and Jake's playing style was so similar that you can't hear too much of a difference. You can hear differences, but they are very similar in, in a lot of ways. And, they, and they're both influenced. You know, I think if you had, you, you could have the most technical guitarists in the world, but if they don't have the foundation musical influences, it's just going to sound completely different. But thankfully, Adrian literally has the same foundational musical influences as Disgorge, Immolation, Gore Guts, and with that ulcerate sort of style that naturally he's just in, he's influenced by the same things as what jake is and so it comes out the same as well and he kind of understands what we're doing when you understand what the essence of a band is you're going to live within the realm of that band it's it's so important for that and it takes time that and and that's what the difficult thing for Donaldson, Chris, Christian Donaldson, when he joined Cryptopsy was, was to, to claim the identity of Cryptopsy and make it his own, but still remaining within what Cryptopsy is. And he's definitely mastered that with the new stuff and with the Book of Suffering. EP, shout out to you, Donaldson. You know, I love you. I have a brand new segment. I've been dropping it in on every interview recently. Uh, it's about mental health. I, I would love to hear about what you do for yourself uh, when you feel not well, when you feel like you need some help, uh, when you're having a dark day. What do you do to cope with that? And then a secondary question is when you feel like your friends are not doing well, how do you reach out to them and what do you say to them? No, those are really good and important questions. And I think from the mental health perspective, it's understanding what sort of releases the pressure in your life. And for me, like that ended up becoming running um, meditation. And like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be that guy that just talks about running, but you know, and a, a big thing for me as well is I, I go through bouts of deleting my social media where I just delete the apps off my phone. And it's not necessarily I'm addicted to posting on, or I'm not addicted to, but I'm addicted to just scrolling, doom scrolling. And I, I don't know if anyone else, like I, I figured a lot of other people do it, but I just find myself mindlessly going through it. And then I'm like, where did the last hour go? And then I just feel like absolute shit. And so well, I think some of the, some of the best things I've done for myself is when I've deleted it for a week and you, you notice for the first day or so, you check your phone and you like you automatically go to go to your app. You know exactly where that button is, right? And it's it's not there. <laughs> and, and then you have to try and fill that gap of time with other stuff, whether it's reading or just, you know, going for a walk or something like that. But well, I think for me, and I would recommend it to anyone, and you know, I honestly think if, if I can do it, someone who never had really run in their entire life, um, just start out running. Because if I go for a run for an hour or even half an hour, you know, that's 
that's half an hour I'm not on my phone. That's half an hour I'm not talking to anyone else actually, and it's half an hour I'm just to my like to my own thoughts. Um, or if I'm listening to music, it's an opportunity where I can listen to an album that I love, where I can really deep listen to it and focus on my breathing, and it can become quite meditative. So I, I think that's kind of what I do to sort of because I, I think I am partial to to feeling like I think most people are to feeling down about things that, you know, everyone goes through the things, if it's lack of sleep or whatever, you can just, or if it's work stress, that sort of thing, you can feel it. Um, and everyone does. So that's where I, I, I try to be super conscious and intentional about things that, you know, are good for me and are going to be good for me tomorrow and going to be good for me in a, in a month from now. When it comes to dealing with friends who may be going through things, I think it's, well, one of the positives, I guess, around the pandemic is it's kind of broken down the stigma of just FaceTiming people. That's true. Just just take a shot at it, yeah. Yeah, but for me, it has anyways, where, you know, Disentomb, like the, the other guys in the band, we never really FaceTimed each other before the, pande- before the pandemic. And then now, you know, we are partial to having group calls and that sort of thing and, and just calling each other one-on-one. Because I think it's one thing to message each other and say, oh, you know, reach out if you need anything. But everyone knows when you're feeling absolutely fucked, the last thing you're probably going to do is reach out even though you should. Um, so I think just probably sporadic calling friends and sort of, you know, being a positive pest in a way. Um, <laughs> and, and I think being totally transparent with your feelings, like, you know, I'll tell the other guys in distant term and the other guys who I'm super close friends with that I love, I love them. You know, like totally just be transparent with how you feel with one another. And I don't know, there's no simple solution to helping, you know, someone through their issues or, you know, to help sort of bring a bit of light into someone's life. But I guess for that, that's kind of what's helped so far for me. The, The pandemic definitely showed us that we can't take anything for granted. So, so tell your friends you love them, tell you how, tell them how you feel about them. That's an important message. I like that. I think that it's very important to, you know, you don't want people feeling alone when they are truly loved as we love our friends. So tell your friends you love them. I like that very much. Um, I'd love to talk more about running. What would be some advice? You said you mentioned everyone should start running. Uh, What is the first step if someone's listening to this and they've been thinking about running? And coincidentally, I literally got new running shoes today. So, so talk, talk to me about what, what steps should someone take if they want to start running? I think that's a good start getting proper shoes. And then just honestly going, just try and run a hundred meters and it's going to feel fucked. Your lungs are going to collapse. Like I used to be a pack a day smoker when I was on tour. So like, yeah, yeah. So my lungs were just totally shot. Um, so I, I think just try and do small incremental runs and just, up the, you know, up the distance every now and again. And don't, you know, don't try and get into it too hardcore from the beginning because you're just going to not enjoy it because the whole thing is trying to enjoy it. It, it, It's a really hard thing because you're not going to enjoy something that makes it feel like you have a chest burster inside you. But (laughs) it does, it does get better. And, you know, the runner's high does actually exist. Um, And I think a big thing is people probably are kind of a bit, like, I know this was for me anyways. I was in my head about, like, how I ran. Like, I was real self-conscious. Like the way, about, you, you, know, the way you looked while you ran? The, the way I look when I run and that sort of thing, which, you know, I don't know if anyone else feels like that, but I was like, and then it's kind of, and then I just got into this mindset, like, anyone who kind of is looking down on me for the way that I run or whatever, like, fuck them, they're a piece of shit. So, I don't know, like, have a spiteful attitude when you go for a run and <laughs> <laughs> you are you are the one going for a run and they're not so yeah that's what i try to tell myself but <laughs> yeah try not to be self-conscious start slowly expect there to be a bit of pain if there's too much pain just maybe slow down a bit and you know try and enjoy it and 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 look at it as a, at, at it as an opportunity to listen to some albums in full you know or to create a killer playlist because you know, we all listen to music when we drive or when we're online or, you know, whatever. But how often do we get an opportunity? I, maybe other people do, but I don't get too much of an opportunity in my life to have a deep listen to 
albums that I really love or to sort of discover or rediscover albums um, that I haven't listened to in a while. I was definitely going to ask, what do you listen to while you ran? That was my next question. So you beat me to it. Ta- talk to me about what gets you going. What gets you through a 15 hour run? Now, were there any, are there any surprise albums that you wouldn't expect Jordan James of Disentombed to be listening to? Oh, 100%. So I listen to a playlist that's curated by me and my mate. And it's literally, you know, it's literally like just really bad rap. So I, I love really like, you know, just, you know, Brockhampton, Ray Schremer, Night Lovell, Migos. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just a lot of like two chains, Kanye West, Maxo Cream, Twenty One Savage. You know that that's kind of my go-to. Just because it, I like running to a beat, and I also like sort of listening to a lot of um, stuff that I loved when I was like eleven. So a lot of Slipknot, a lot of System of a Down. It, it, to be honest, it's really hard to run to Brutal Death. Yeah. I, I don't, yeah. I, I, that, that's the one time I don't want to listen to Brutal Death Metal is when I'm running. I want to listen to some, I don't know. And I'll, for example, when I'm saying like I love deep listening, I'll listen to, you know, all of Nirvana's discography. Or, that, you know, I have a, a pretty broad taste in music, so I'll listen to a whole bunch of different shit. Um, but when I did the 15 hour run, um, for the first seven hours, I didn't listen to music. I just sort of listened to my mind and just try to sort of not rely on music to get me through it. And then when the pain started setting in where I felt like I couldn't run anymore, that's when I started introducing music. Um, I try, try to listen to some podcasts. Um, that sort of, you know, inspirational podcasts, as wanky as that sounds, you know, David Goggins and all that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so I'll listen to a wide variety of things, whatever sort of my mood pulls me into at that point. I love it. What's your dog's name? Uh, that's Ronald, the sausage dog. Excellent. I'm sure the listeners are curious. Sausage dogs, Ronald and Penelope. Two sausage dogs, Ronald and Penelope. I like that. I, I have one last question for you before I turn you over to the Thirsty Thursday gang. Uh, I did not ask you last time. It's something that I started doing during the pandemic. It's the classic Vox and Hops wrap-up question. Uh, it probably doesn't happen to you anymore, but it most definitely used to happen to you when you were on tour. Uh, what is your hangover cure? Um, probably a Denny's uh, breakfast of some sort. That's like usually an easy go-to. Um, but lo- like I said earlier, I'm not that big of a drinker. Like I've gone entire tours without drinking. Um, you know, I just sort of made the sort of goal of not drink, you know, I was always super worried about getting sick and fucking up my vocals. So it was, um, you know, I was as much as I'm a boring person after the pandemic, I was pretty boring beforehand too. So. <laughs> boring. And then I don't agree with that. It's like the running. It's, it's like the, the way you look while you run, the way you live your life. Fuck everyone else have if they don't, if they have any problem with the way you live your life. Uh, Thursday, Thursday, gang, you know the drill. If you have any questions for Jordan James or Dissent Tomb, raise your digital hand and I shall call upon you. And uh, Jordan uh, will answer your question. As always, we have a Phil Dervy test of the Whispers from the Void podcast. Who is going to ask the first question? Here we go. Go for it, Phil. Hi. Hi, Jordan. What's hey, up? Dude, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, so my question, I was thinking about it, like when I was driving and I was like, because I always ask question about like, oh, uh, what, what tour you want to do with what band? So I'm like, if you have a tour to plan, you have to just make a tour of yep. every genre of what you want. Okay. Who, what do you want for an artist as a headliner, mm. uh, maybe two headliners, whatever, and a support act? Or two? Okay, that's a really good question. So the headliner would be Tame Impala. Ooh. Um, second headliner would be Ulcerate. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and then the supports would be uh, Disgorge and Morbid Angel. <laughs> the most part, a pretty stock standard death metal tour other than Tame Impala. I, if you can get Tame Impala to agree with that and Disentomb will open, that'll be, uh, I'd love that. You're just like doing like fucking death metal and you're like, 
Punk Hill Entertainment Parlor instead, just to calm everyone up. <laughs> Yeah, everyone can chill out afterwards to Tame Impala. Yeah, that'd that's be perfect. Great. I I would go to that tour for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I definitely would too. I'll, I'll try and make it happen. Perfect. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Love it. Thanks, Phil. Uh, the metal architect himself, Jerry Monk. Go for it. Well, he kind of answered my question earlier about the direction of the new album because you know the last couple have been kind of dissonant and atmospheric. So, but if you could. If you were stranded on a desert island, what is the one album you would take with you? Probably related to the previous question, um, probably Tame Impala's Currents. That's just my all-time favorite album. Um, yeah, it just means a lot to me, that album. But it, uh, I can probably answer your previous one in terms of the new style of Distant Tomb. I would say the most it's the most pointed lyrically in terms of, you know, all the other ones have been sort of a mix of myth, biblical stuff and beasts and this one's a lot more pointed around atheism um and point really sort of leaning into that a whole lot there's still a lot of sort of um dorky lord of the rings beast stuff in there but there is a lot of a strong push towards um talking about the themes of anti-theism and atheism which is something you know i really enjoy reading and listening about so i think when you read through the lyrics you'll see a lot of that is, was that easier because there's four songs to work with versus a whole album to like tie them all together into one thematic? Yeah, definitely. Because I think if you're writing 13 songs around one theme and that theme is, you know, that there is no God, um, you know, it might become a little bit repetitive. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you have four tracks, you can sort of break that off into four pillars. What does that mean that there is no God? Um, and it's much easier to sort of dissect and explore that a bit. Very cool, very cool. Some bands have make whole careers out of there is no God, though. But uh, I, I appreciate, I, I like your approach. I like. I can assure there's no song called "Mad at God" on there. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, go for it. Um, uh, COVID aside, or the pandemic aside, as a band, are there any like situations or experiences you've had to deal with that you didn't expect? when you started, you know, as, as a band or getting into being in a band, um, whether it's, you know, touring or management or uh, venue, something happened, just something out of the blue you didn't think would be the way it was? For us, anyways, it's been around um, probably negotiating because I, I do a lot of the negotiating in terms of pay and that sort of thing. And I think it's building confidence over the years around what you're worth, because especially for the first, you know, half a decade, even you're kind of taking whatever you can get and, and you feel really difficult. You you feel it's, it's a massive challenge. I feel around um, valuing your art as much as you kind of like, we know we play ridiculous music that sounds like static to 99% of people in the world. Um, But it's also understanding there is value to your music and there's value to your time that you're putting into it. And I think there probably is a little bit of a mindset within the brutal death or death metal community that, you know, if you ask for your fair share, you're somehow a sellout or that sort of thing. But I think just navigating, negotiating what you're worth is probably something, you know, we never had in mind when we started the band and even when we started touring internationally. But then, you know, I guess working out the logistics of uh, of being away on tour for 16 weeks and the lit- and doing that over, say, Europe and the and the US, um, yeah, just navigating all the logistics of that and actually working it out, you know, what we should be getting or what we feel that we should be getting and making sure that matches the demand for promoters and that sort of thing. That's probably a little bit of a, um, yeah, that was just something we never had any sort of... Um, insight into going into it you know we are uh, we just have to learn as we went i'm, I'm sure like everyone else hmm. it's 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 so difficult so we talked about the last time we were together so much difficult for bands from australia so far away you guys end up leaving for 16 weeks as you mentioned which means you're hitting both a u.s tour popping up into canada for some dates a full european tour back to back most of the time 
what a commitment and it's it's the finances have to be there if not you know leaving the family at home leaving the job at home taking your vacation to do it it has to be worth it so you're 100 percent right arguing for your worth uh, colby how's it going guys i want to say i love your band dude fucking awesome oh, hopefully we get to see you grace uh north america soon enough again so you know, it's been since 2019 i think right bloodletting north america yes you touched on this a little bit. I don't know if I missed it at all, but I just I was curious how you got into wanting to be a metal vocalist besides just singing in your shower when you were 15 years old. It was it was sort of the um, the last opportunity because um, Jake started playing guitar when he was 12. I bought a bass guitar um, and you know learned pretty quickly that I sucked at it. Um, and you know, if I sucked at bass, I wasn't going to be good at drums. So I started making dumb noises with my voice, and thankfully, you know, I I was able to do it to a passable level that I was able to hang out with some very talented people. Um, and, and naturally, it came from you know, I think with my personality type, I am um, a bit of an you know an attention seeker in a way. Um, so oh, I naturally gravitated towards wanting to be a front man. And, you know, I, I think seeing, you know, video clips of Morbid Angel or Cannibal Corp, you know, seeing someone like Corpse Grinder on stage when you're 14 and being like, oh, I want to be that dude, you know. I want to have a neck thicker than my head and sound like a demon from hell. Like, you know, that, that just naturally appealed to me. And, and so I just started doing it and, Thankfully, I was able to do something that's passable that, you know, and hang out with some really talented people that meant I could do it in a band. It's good advice, people. If you can't play music, an instrument, <laughs> make sure your friends are super talented and learn how to scream. Uh, Chris Potter, go for it. Uh, you mentioned you don't like uh, brutal death metal for your running. I'm a power lifter myself. I'm just curious, like, A, are you going to ever get back into weightlifting? And B, Back when you were weightlifting, what was your playlist like? Uh, so I recently started getting back into um, weightlifting just to help with my running. But, like, actually, I've, I started deadlifting again just, you know, earlier this week. I did deadlifts for the first time in ages. Um, and when I was, you know, lifting a lot more weights and probably doing a little bit more powerlifting, you know, four or five years ago, um, I probably was listening to a lot more brutal death metal. Well, I think my my music playlists um, change with whatever I'm doing, um, but you know I, I love listening to Defeated Sanity or Disgorge when I'm lifting. There's, like especially if there's just a certain song and there's like if I'm going in for a deadlift and there's a certain bit that I want to lift lift to, you know I, I love just choosing a song. Um, but otherwise, I like listening to a lot of hardcore. Um, while I lift, um, and you know, they're, they're a super hype band, but I love Knock Loose and I love lifting to Knock Loose. Um, but yeah, I, I've started lifting a lot recently, you know, in the last few weeks I've, I've been lifting a lot more and just trying to get that balance between, um, lifting and running because I don't want to just, you know, be a guy that runs a bit because I, I you know, I was into weightlifting for so many years. And sort of, and that was a big part of my identity for so many years. And it, it has felt weird to sort of transition into, you know, not being that guy that, you know, was kind of a bit bigger and, and, and that sort of thing. That, um, so I'm trying to sort of get a, a healthy balance with that again as well. It's a good question, though. Love it. Love the balance, the thematic of balance coming up through this. Uh, a question for myself. Uh, with the help of the metal architect, a why has it not happened? That's probably because it's very complicated. But like a full Australian lineup, U.S. tour, U a European tour. Um, obviously, Psychroptic comes to mind. Um, what other bands should be there? Jer Jerry, help me with this. What other bands? There's, there's I mean, werewolves, werewolves, but, that's, but werewolves. werewolves are also psychroptic, so that doesn't help really. Yeah. Well, I mean, but I mean, take a break in between, like disentomb, psychroptic, and then a band in between. Hmm. 
you know, if it wasn't just strictly death metal, like they are sort of towards the death metal side of deathcore, but you could have a version's crown. Mm. They're a great band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a there's a band there's a band called Resin Tomb that the guy is also yeah. in Siberian Hell Sounds and like a million other fucking bands. You could have them as well. Yeah, we're good. We're good friends with those dudes. Um, yeah, we we played a show with them last year in July, actually. So. Yeah, look, there's definitely enough quality in Australia where you could organise it. It would just be a matter of being really intentional about booking something like that. And I think, you know, if you had a band like, or if you had bands like Psychroptic and Disentomb with the idea of, you know, going out there with maybe two others, you could definitely do it for sure. Um, and I think there probably needs to be something like that, you know, like to fly the flag a bit. Or maybe you could have sort of Australia and New Zealand considering we're, pretty much the same country um you can call it like c is not the is not a swear word or something across yeah. Yeah. <laughs> across <laughs> north america or something <laughs> just, Down under, up over. <laughs> just a thought uh jordan thank you so so much for hanging out with me the thirsty thursday gang this is always a blast i'm so stoked to have you back on the podcast uh, basically almost 300 episodes later so damn cool. Can't wait to hang out again in the flesh. Uh, looking forward to it already. I'm very, very excited about the new EP, Nothing Above. It's going to be massive. Uh, when can people maybe think of it hearing some of this new material? Uh, we're hoping to release a single sort of by September, October, um, with a release later this year through Unique Leader Records. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll be out all through our socials and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, just want to say congratulations, man. Last time we actually spoke, you know, episode 88, it's been great to see, you know, you thrive and not only survive through the pandemic, but thrive and to see Box and Hops become such a massive thing and, you know, and that you've got a community built. It's been awesome to see. Well, thank you so, so much. And thank you for hanging out with me. Massive cheers. As always, Thirsty Thursday gang, unmute yourselves. Make some noise for Jordan Jane's A Distant Tomb. We had a blast. You should have been here with us, everyone. You could have made noise right now, too. Here we go. Make some noise. Three, two, one. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right today. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this was an awesome Thirsty Thursday virtual hang. What a blast this was. I love reconnecting with Vox and Hops alumni and seeing how they've been. Because, you know, we, we talk, we hang out a lot. And then, boom, we're separated for two years, basically, because of a global pandemic. We, we kept in touch a little bit here and there, but it's nothing like sitting down and sharing a beer with someone and actually having a conversation. Such a blast. Very excited for that brand new Distant 2 material that's coming up. You should get excited for it as well. Massive cheers to Jordan. I uh, want to start running. You're inspiring me. I'm going to hit the pavement, uh, and I will be thinking of you as I do it. Now, if you enjoyed this Vox & Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox & Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You can on my website, Vox & Hops. Dot com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S dot com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a month that contains all of the details of everything that has happened recently in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal podcast. You'll get to see which episodes I've released recently. You'll get to see which episodes I have coming up. You'll get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew have reviewed recently. You'll get to see any information about any projects I have in the works before I announce them to the public. And trust me, I always have a bunch of things going on behind the scenes. You also get to see which albums... Jerry Monk, the metal architect himself, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist the most extreme, fresh, new music that is dropping every week. Jerry listens to it all somehow, and he puts it on the playlist for you to enjoy. It's available on both Apple Music and Spotify. The Brutal Awakenings playlist is what you want to be listening to. Trust me. There is just so much going on in the world of the Vox and Hospital podcast. I hate for you to miss a single thing, so sign up to the mailing list. The Vox and Hospital podcast is brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcasts. I hope you have a killer, killer weekend. I will be back next week with one episode on Tuesday, but until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops heads. Oh,